The Ross Tilly Burn Center, part of Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, is a state-of-the-art facility providing tertiary care for the majority of burn injury patients in Ontario. While the majority of patients are burned by fire or scalds, 11.5%, so nearly 12%, suffer electrical burns. In fact, the Ross Tilly Burn Center and St. John's Rehab have embarked on a joint program in electrical injury care and research to ensure the highest possible quality of care is available to patients with electrical injuries. The subject of electrical injury and the research being done at St. John's Rehab and Ross Tilly Burn Center have had a special place in my heart ever since my visit to St. John's Rehab for our special feature, The Road to Recovery from Invisible Electrical Injury back in 2010. And now for my special guest, Dr. Mark Yeshke, who among numerous other positions and credentials is the director of the Ross Tilly Burn Center. And he joins me now to talk about electrical injury care and research. Welcome, Dr. Yeshke. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Now, Dr. Yeshke, before I get into the crux of our conversation, uh, just to get to know you a little bit better, I'd, I'd like to know how you became involved with electrical injury care and research. Um, <clears throat> and that's a good question. Actually, it started when I was uh, staff at uh, the Shriners Hospital to, for Children at Galveston, UTMB at Galveston. When I got involved in here, with, uh, and I came to Toronto in 2010, uh, learning about the back on track and electrical injury specialty group at St. John's. Uh, then I was asked to join them. And then when I did join them, so I was delighted to say, yes, uh, let's, uh, let's join them and build this program for electrically injured patients, which is again, part of uh, St. John's now is part of Sunnybrook, but at that time it was a separate hospital. So that's how it all started. And I think we started exactly like 10 years ago, uh, like in 2011. So it has been some time now, some interesting times. Ah, well, and we're going to get to those interesting times, uh, I think, actually, perhaps right now, uh, because back in 2010, uh, I had interviewed Dr. Joel Fish uh, at the time, yeah. Chief Medical Officer of St. John's yeah. Rehab, uh, and the subject was about invisible electrical injury. And during that interview, he said, I myself in the beginning did not believe this existed. Uh, now, a decade has gone by since that interview with Dr. Fish. So outside of obvious electrical injury, like a burn, um, how have attitudes changed in the medical community or outside the medical community with regard to invisible electrical injury? Frustratingly, I would say not a lot. Um, and again, it's very frustrating because we still struggle to educate uh, not only you know, one would think, well, healthcare providers should know, but even healthcare providers um, struggle to recognize that low voltage injuries that you can't, that are invisible, are falling off the cliff because there is no evidence. Uh, we know that all the testing is negative. And uh, obviously, when you have negative testing, well, it must be all in your mind and uh, it doesn't exist. So I, I had also a learning curve because in pediatrics, you do not observe this low voltage with the significant mental health and other components. You don't. Um, and so it was a learning curve for me as well, which took some time, but uh, I, I really, the amount of patients we saw and how this developed, um, I, would, I actually would uh, underscore what Dr. Fish was saying. And so I, I really struggled at the beginning. It's like, wow, there is a significant impact of an injury that is not being recognized and uh, you don't have testing and you run EMGs, EEGs, MRIs, CTs, and you name it, you do all the testing, you don't find anything. Um, and again, believe me, even in medical professionals, it is still not completely um, accepted, let alone insurance agencies, uh, other workmen's institutions, or even employees, even companies. To this day, people struggle to get accepted and to be recognized to have had an electrical injury. So, so it is, it is, it's a very, it is not very well accepted. And this is very sad. That I, I can only just imagine how frustrating that can be uh, for the sufferers of an invisible injury for yourself and your team uh, who, who know it to be there, but don't have those, uh, those hard results that you can show someone. Uh, right. Now, over the past 10 years, 
Uh, and without making any assumptions, I'll put the question to you. Uh, now, have there been any advancements, uh, at least in, in identifying or better understanding uh, electrical injury uh, with the research that, uh, that you and others have been doing? And, and where you're concerned, are there any particular research tracks that you're engaged yeah. with now? I think what we, there's several things we learned over the last 10 years. Um, first of all is really the impact that like low voltage electrical injuries can have. So being recognizing, and then we here locally in Ontario work very hard in various aspects, insurance, uh, workman's comp to really get this recognized and fought for our patients to uh, saying it happens and it's real and you need to be aware of this and uh, we need to work together as teams in order to get this uh, forward. And we went many times, we actually went to WSAB, it's our, our workman's comp down physically to present and educate. So this numerous times. And I think that is something that improved. Research wise, I think there is a little bit more understanding about uh, what's going on in terms of the cell. So we're doing some research to understand what is actually causing and uh, is this inflammatory? How is the electricity causing those, those changes? You know, inflammatory dri driven, is it by cell membrane? Is this permeability or what is going on? There are various cellular components that we are trying to understand. And uh, uh, I think we made some advancements. We still don't unravel the mystery. Um, and so there are, it's very difficult to reliably and objectively identify the sequelae of a low voltage electrical injuries still to this day. But there are some notions. And as I had in my talk, uh, there's something called channel channelopathies where your cell channels are being affected because you need to remember the voltage by which these channels act are much, much lower, even when you have 10 volts going into your body. I mean, if you lick a battery, you can have a low voltage injury and nobody ever will know this. You can have sequelae. Um, and so basically there is a lot more science and uh, some real trying to understand what's going on. So this is happening. And I'm very confident that for the next five, 10 years, we have a better understanding. Um, and, uh, and that I think is very important in order to develop new therapies. But what we're missing, I think is really diagnostics um, because all the tests and we do the diligence because everybody wants those tests. But I always sit there and tell my patients, well, I'm sorry, you have to go through this administrative nightmare. However, it will all be negative. Don't be frustrated. Your MRI, your CT, your EMG, your cardiac, the da, you da, it's all going to be negative, and there won't be anything. And so, sorry, but we have to do this due to due diligence, right? And uh, it's just very frustrating because there's nothing visible, and this is where they struggle. It's nothing visible. The tests are negative. Well, it must be all in your mind. It must be faking. It must be made up, and so forth. So. Um, I think that is very frustrating for patients because then all of a sudden they have a private investigator following them, checking what they're doing, um, you know, insurances or care providers not providing the care they need because it's all made up. So it is a very hard, uh, it's a very hard uh, disease process after this, and that's still not really well understood. But there's some hope, there's some developments, uh, there's some science going on in various uh, institutions in the U.S. Uh, as well as here. So I'm hopeful that we maybe make some progress and I'm, I'm confident we will, but diagnostics is something that we're clearly missing. No, that's excellent to hear that uh, you remain positive of what's uh, coming down the road, uh, but it is unfortunate and frustrating. Uh, all of these other things that you point to, uh, <laughs> private investigators following you and, and, and that, and uh, this actually leads nicely to uh, uh, the next point, next question I want to bring up, and, and that's about uh, the mental toll it, it must take yeah. on victims. Uh, so... Uh, probably in the last few months, uh, Ontario's Electrical Safety Authority announced it is donating 250000 over five years to the Ross Tilly Burn Centre. Now, in their announcement, they refer to the mental toll, in addition to the physical toll, that an electrical injury can have on a patient. And, and you were also quoted as saying that mental health is completely underappreciated. So you've already touched on this, but can you tell me a little bit more about this mental struggle and the importance of establishing a recovery program that goes beyond yeah. the physical? <clears throat> so we recently published a paper uh, where we looked at the largest series yet. It was, uh, it was almost 300 patients and uh, acutely and long-term. And what we found was that 50% of the patients are affected mental health-wise. So, um, 
when we diagnose this depression or anxiety, depression, you name it, there's a major mental health alterations. And it, regardless whether it's high voltage or low voltage, you have a very strong um, impact of electrical. And it was in BMC, British Medical uh, Journal, uh, open and we published that. And that was the largest here. So indicating there's this huge toll. And again, I can actually, I, I don't need to know anything about this patient. If I hear the symptoms that I hear is like, I can't focus, I can't sleep, I'm insomniac. Um, I, I can concentrate, I have headaches, uh, I feel fatigued, I feel exhausted. I can tell you right now, I know exactly what it is. I know 100% this is an electrical injury. So then you have, that's the bottom line. Then there comes GI problems, digestion problems, not like nutrition problems. There comes even more se severe cases that have like, uh, almost like stroke-like symptomatics where they have half of their body is uh, like in stroke, right? They can't move, they can't walk. Um, they have neurologic deficits. I mean, these are more severe patients and fortunately not very often, but we do have them. Um, muscle pain, muscle agony and so forth. And some people even have seizures. So <clears throat> that alone, can, you can imagine you have those symptoms. Obviously you have mental impact, mental health impact. And then nobody takes you serious and then being prosecuted, pursued by whatever, not getting the funds. I mean, it's not a surprise that people are extremely depressed, are extremely anxious, are having this mental component. And uh, what we really don't know, and this is why I said this here, is still completely underappreciated, is like, what exactly are the diagnoses? Are these people really depressed or do they have uh, anxiety driven to depression? Or do they have, you know, what is exactly the outlook? What diagnosis is this major depressive disorder? Does it have a component of bipolar? And again, so it would be nice to have this understanding a little bit better. Um, and that is what we're doing. We're actually looking into the electrical injured patients and seeing what exactly is on the axis of depression and mental health affection. Uh, where are we? What are we really dealing with? And, uh, how can we treat it, right? Because I believe that how do you generalize pain syndrome? I mean, how do we how, how do we how do we feel pain? Is our central nervous system? Um, and uh, again, but if you're depressed, you feel much more pain as when you're not. Yeah, but if you say, yeah, how do we treat it? Because somebody active is not depressed. But if you have in pain and muscle ache, you're not going to be one immobile or active. So it is this vicious circle that you're entering. Um, and I really believe, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the last question, we're lacking good diagnostics and we're lacking really understanding from the mental health a little bit, the, the component. And then actually that would result and translate into proper treatment uh, where we can say, you know, which medication would actually be beneficial to you. And just not like through every antidepressant that a patient saying, oh, yeah, we're doing this, like this broad treatments and they, you don't really fix it anyway. Well, I'm glad to hear there are champions like yourself who who uh, take the physical and and also want to understand more about the mental uh, to try to deliver yeah. the best outcome possible. So that's great yeah. to hear. Uh, now, research is important. Uh, research needs funds. It 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 needs to. Uh, I mean, with, with, without it, you you can't do research. You can't push that boundary. You can't push the right. envelope. So. <clears throat> We, we talked about, and I had mentioned the donation made uh, by Electrical Safety Authority. How can industry stakeholders help support your research into electrical injury? Uh, as you said, it, it is important. And I mean, we really, nowadays, the granting agencies are very tough to come by, as we all know, right? NIH, CHR, you name it, it's very difficult, especially if you have a kind of like a border disease process. It's not like electrical injuries are thousands a day, um, but it's, so it's not a very common injury pattern. It's very rare, but that means also this rare disease is not heavily of interest for funding agencies because it doesn't impact the broad masses. I think the community really does not appreciate these injuries like they do cancer or cardiovascular disease or any other of those. So that's why donations and support by the, the specialized industry is highly, highly appreciated and needed. Otherwise, you can't conduct research. Well, my hope is that after viewers uh, watch this and, and read more about this discussion, 
that uh, hopefully more uh, donations, funds will come your way to keep the ball rolling on this so that more research can be done and we get to those better outcomes. Uh, now, right. before, I, before I let you go, Dr. Yeshke, uh, while I was doing a little bit of research on you before this uh, conversation, I came upon some very interesting technology with which you're involved that you're developing. And yeah. I'm probably going to uh, not describe it very well, but uh, it's kind of like a skin printer. That's correct. <laughs> well, yeah, if you do that too, <clears throat> and actually fascinating me, uh, let me maybe if we have two minutes. So it, this is also something that we started in collaboration with a scientist. So the vision we had is to print somebody's, your own skin, to take cells, uh, to isolate and extract them and then have a delivery device that three-dimensionally print your own skin. So you get a fast wound healing with no scarring. This project, we had an engineer and myself shared this vision. Obviously we were seeking funds for this, but again, like an electrical injury, we were told by the funding agency, this is not fundable. It's too visionary, it's too absurd. This is never gonna happen, we don't pay this. So we actually were very lucky because we found a, a sponsor and a donor uh, because that uh, and it's electrical injury, it's Toronto Hydro. Uh, and the board really, uh, because there are these days high voltage de de devastating detrimental effects on muscle and skin and bone. And they believe that, oh, wow, that uh, somebody can grow skin and maybe even other tissues. Uh, they felt that this um, journey is very fascinating because it leads to a journey is uh, to restore life with no scars and no pain and no suffering. Um, and so they were on board over the last, uh, I believe, six years with substantial amount of donations. And again, all the agencies didn't believe we can do it. And then uh, about four years ago, we got our first uh, provincial grant and then after that, a larger grant. So now we are actually very close to conduct the first human trial. So you see where donation, you asked me about the importance of donations from the industry and from stakeholders. That's exactly it. We had and nobody believing us. We had just a stakeholder industry believe and share the vision. And now look, we're a year away from a clinical trial, potentially really changing the game, how we care for patients with large wounds and burns. It is absolutely fascinating. Uh, you know, uh, seeing it or reading about it is is one thing, but hearing you talk about it makes me even more excited about it. I, I, I can't <laughs> I can't wait how those human trials go. You said in about a year, and uh, and well done, Hydro One for stepping in and and supporting yeah. that research. Yeah. Well, Doctor Yeshke, I've I've had a excellent conversation with you. I I love what you're working on. I love the fact that there are some champions. They're uh, still studying, still researching, uh, and, and confirming that, uh, at least on the invisible side, electrical injury does exist. And yeah. we need to do more to, to better understand it and raise awareness and, and hopefully uh, you know, work on those diagnostics and, and the mental toll to get to that outcome we want for, for victims of invisible electrical injury. That's right. Absolutely agreed. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeshka. Well, thank you for your time.